Good morning, or good afternoon, I guess. It's right afternoon. I'm Mike Osborne of UCSB's program in the history of science, technology, and medicine. And I'm director of UCSB's New Visions of Nature, Science, and Religion initiative. First, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, which include the John Templeton Foundation and departments throughout UCSB's College of Letters and Science. The New Visions Initiative is a collaborative effort of scientists, social science scientists, and humanists. Our collective research has produced two volumes with Oxford University Press and articles in both scientific and humanistic journals. Our research focuses on key unresolved issues central to science, society, and religion. Today, with Professor Farber's intervention, we ask the questions, what are the lessons of nature? How have biologists interpreted those lessons? And should these lessons really guide human action? Professor Farber took his undergraduate degree in zoology and his PhD in history and philosophy of science. He is currently distinguished professor of zoology and history at Oregon State University. And he's also editor of the Journal of the History of Biology. Professor Farber has just completed a manuscript on theories of race mixing. Um, and now, with his wife, the actress and scholar of Russian drama, Vrenly Farber, he is at work on a biography of the Ukrainian Drosophila geneticist, Theodosius Dobzhansky. Now, our speaker today has done fundamental work on the species concept, the history of natural history, including taxidermy, and the status, really, of evolutionary ethics. He continues to challenge the way we think about biology and really the social and political niches in which biology persists. Several books and articles have flowed almost effortlessly, I like to think, from his pen, notably his book entitled Discovering Birds, The Emergence of Ornithology as a Scientific Discipline, provided us with a model of how disciplines form and in its wake, the history of science really has reformulated itself around the history of disciplines, which is a significant part of the research front in history of science today. Another book that he wrote, Finding Order in Nature, The Naturalist Tradition from Linnaeus to E.O. Wilson, as well as an earlier book on the temptations of evolutionary ethics, inform his address today, entitled Biology and Ethics. Professor Farber. Yeah, thanks, Mike, for that gracious introduction. It's, it's very nice to be here in Santa Barbara. I guess it's always nice to be in Santa Barbara. Um, if you were a young girl or boy in the early 1950s and watched TV on Saturday mornings, you're likely to have seen a program called Watch Mr. Wizard. It was a brainchild of Don Herbert, who ran the show starting in 1951 and entertained his audience with an engaging set of gee whiz experiments, often with materials found around the home, and intended to demonstrate various principles about the natural world. The show was a big hit, and the term Mr. Wizard became part of the vocabulary of the decade. It also reflected the pervasively positive attitude towards science. Science and technology promised to create a better and more prosperous life for what would become the baby boom generation. When the Soviets launched their space satellite, Sputnik, in 1957, and the US government wanted to accelerate the growth of science and technology in American schools, they were able to draw on this fascination with science that had become so deeply ingrained. The confidence in the ability of science to solve problems was an integral component of thinking in the 50s. And historians often talk about the scientism of the period. Scientism is the view that science provides the best answers for answering questions about the natural world, about social problems, and about cultural issues. Scientism, of course, was not new to the 1950s. It's had a long history, going at least back to the 18th century, and is often associated with various schools of positivist philosophy. This is Auguste Comte, the founder of French positivist philosophy, um, as well as with the broader Enlightenment agenda. 
In the United States, forms of scientism were quite popular in the 50s when scientific methods and technological fixes seemed to hold out the promise of solving important problems facing Americans in the post-war era in housing, agriculture, transportation, industry, advertising, medicine, child psychology, and education, to mention a few. In retrospect, our overconfidence in science to solve so many perplexing issues looks a bit naive today. And the very term scientism has taken on a somewhat pejorative connotation. The various revolutions of the 60s, with their questioning of all authority and rationality, and the emergence also beginning in the late 60s of various post-positivist philosophies, have undercut the often simplistic ways of framing problems in the 1950s. It's difficult to imagine anyone today not realizing that environmental challenges have social as well as scientific dimensions, or that politics play a role in biomedical policy. In spite of the onslaught of postmodernism and the widespread public skepticism today about many of the universal accepted ideas in science, let's not forget that polls suggest that half the population in this country don't accept the theory of evolution, and that's just a couple hours down the freeway from here. We still find strong strains of scientism in the United States, particularly in the area of biology and ethics. Evolutionary psychologists, sociobiologists, and a number of philosophers of science argue that biology can provide a foundation for ethics and can be used to answer ethical problems that emerge in biomedical research and technology, as well as in more traditional areas of the life sciences. That is, science offers a better model and a better set of methods to solve ethical issues than the disciplines and subjects that traditionally have been consulted that is, the humanities, particularly philosophy. As a historian of science, I find this very strange. One of the main lessons that emerges from the study of the history of science, especially the history of the life sciences, is how often in the past scientific arguments with little or no empirical evidence or theoretical foundation have been used to legitimate social values. That is, writers have used the prestige of science to support ideas and biases that originated and were held on grounds that had nothing to do with science. One thinks, for example, of the ways in which the theory of evolution was used to justify conservative as well as opposing liberal social and economic policies in the 19th and early 20th centuries. William Graham Sumner, the person on the, right, on the left, one of the fathers of modern American sociology, used evolution to argue for laissez-faire economic and social policies. The open market, he believed, would lead to a natural selection of talent and that the best fitted administrators would rise to the top positions in industry and government. Anyone who's had any experience in uh, administration would, would find that a very dubious uh, proposal, but nonetheless he made it. In contrast, Lester Frank Ward, uh, shown on the right, another founding father of sociology, put forth a diametrically opposed view, that nature demonstrated how inefficient nature was as a process. Think of all the acorns produced compared to the number of oak trees that we see. And that government regulation was necessary to create an efficient, fair, and progressive society. Both Ward and Sumner appealed to evolutionary arguments to support, in one case, a conservative agenda, in the other case, a liberal one. So what this demonstrates is that while the theory of evolution may be compatible with a conservative or a liberal interpretation, it doesn't imply either one. One can't validly imply contradictory propositions. Even more dramatic has been the uncovering of the history of the early eugenics movement, which so clearly, from today's perspective, read its own cultural and social values into nature. Eugenicists, like Grant Haig, argued during the first decades of the 20th century that unless we instituted eugenic measures, the American race would be extinct by today, as to say by, 19, uh, by uh, 2007, by which he meant that so many people would be dying in infancy or would be imbeciles that we would face total social and cultural collapse. 
among the threats to the gene pool, as we would call it today, he listed the tango and the delicatessen store. <laughs> you can only wonder what he would have thought of Red Bull or rap music. His, his human pedigrees demonstrating the inheritance of deleterious characteristics included genetic factors for tramps, evil women, goiter, feeble-mindedness, criminal tendencies, and alcoholism. For him, the most pressing social problems of the day were at root biological. And these are two pictures uh, from, from Haig's book, evidence of a, a vigorous mind and evidence of a feeble mind. Um, the the, the take-home message is, which family would you want your son or daughter to marry into? You know, clearly, uh, the uh, vigorous mind. It's not difficult for us today to see how much Haig and others were reading into nature their, their biases and concerns, anti-immigration attitudes, class tensions, and cultural dislocation due to industrialization and urbanization. Eugenicists used the new science of genetics to construct recommendations on subjects that had little to do with genetics and more to do with their economics, politics, and racism. At the heart of their confusion was their attempt to use science to legitimate social and cultural opinions. These days, it's difficult to get away with such blatant moves, although the flap over the book, The Bell Curve, shows that the issue is not completely dead. There are more subtle areas of confusion, however, that should concern us. In particular, the attempt to use science to give us guidance on ethical issues. There's no doubt that modern biology and medicine raise important ethical questions. But can we also use science to solve them? I think the history of science should make us very cautious about any such claim. One that has been getting a lot of currency for at least the last 25 years is that the theory of evolution can serve as a, as a foundation for ethics. That is, we can look to evolution for guidance in living the good life. The position, of course, is plausible, given that the theory of evolution claims humans evolved from earlier primates, that is, non-human forms. If we and our social structures are the products of evolution, perhaps a better understanding of that evolution can provide lessons and standards for behavior. Can, in fact, help us understand what are right from what are wrong actions, and can serve as a guide to decision making in areas of biology, from stem cell research to genetic engineering. Darwin certainly believed that humans possessed a moral capacity which he considered the main chasm, that is to say, the, the, the distinguishing characteristic between man and the animals. For him, understanding the origin of our moral sense was a critical step in elaborating a plausible theory of evolution, because if he couldn't account for this central feature of human behavior, then his theory would be incomplete. Darwin addressed the issue in The Descent of Man, which he published in 1871. He noted that contemporary ethnographers had recorded a set of universal ethical norms that could be arranged on a continuum in, in time and space, from rude barbarism to high civilization. Further, he drew on the psychology of his day, which explained moral habits through a sympathy of individuals for others, and by the internalization of society's punishment of deviant behavior. He combined these ideas with his concept of natural selection to yield the following explanation. With increased intelligence, early humans became capable of having certain sentiments, sympathy, fidelity, courage, which gave advantages to their group. Such groups survived better than other groups. Finally, a highly complex sentiment having its first origin in social instincts largely guided by the approbation of our fellow men, ruled by reason, self-interest, and in later times by deep religious feelings, confirmed by instruction and habit, all combined and constitute our moral sense or conscience. He was confident that further study would uncover the adaptive value of the universal moral ethical norms uncovered by ethnography, and in so doing, the issue of the basis of ethical systems would be resolved by natural history. Now, let's be clear about what Darwin was doing and not doing. He was saying an empirical claim. 
that human societies share a basic set of ethical norms, and that the origin of those norms could be explained by human psychology and its history. He was not claiming that those ethical norms were justified or that they were valid. That is, he was explaining their origin, but not saying anything about what the ethical standards should be. Darwin's explanation was highly speculative, but it fit nicely with his overall theory, and it was consistent. In contrast, in Darwin's day, there were a number of writers who wanted to use evolution as a justification or as a foundation for ethics. And that was a much stronger claim. That is, they wanted to argue that the theory of evolution justified a certain set of behavioral actions or prohibitions. By good luck, they happened to be the ones they had grown up with on different grounds. Now, I've written about this topic, so I don't want to spend too much time on it today. Let me just note that in the late part of the 19th century, British and American society had undergone profound changes associated with industrialization and urbanization. And that as a consequence, Anglo-American society had become significantly secular. In intellectual circles, and that would include the professional and educated ones, doubt was cast on the literal reading of the standard foundations for ethics, that is to say, scripture. This is not that suddenly, it's not to say that suddenly there were people wondering if it was okay to murder or commit adultery or steal from their neighbors, but rather they felt the need to justify their convic convictions in a way that didn't depend upon documents, scripture, that had lost much of their absolute authority. Philosophers were deeply engaged in this enterprise, as you might well guess. And a number of important writers, for the most part not philosophers, attempted to devise ethical systems that rested on ev an evolutionary foundation. Uh, Herbert Spencer on the far left, Leslie Stephen in the middle, and John Fisk uh, on the right were probably the most well-known in the 19th century, um, Spencer and Stephen being English, uh, Fisk being American. Although each of the three individuals that I've just mentioned were widely read and respected, professional philosophers subjected their views on ethics to a withering critique. The leading moral philosopher at Cambridge University, Henry Sidgwick, was biting in his dismissal. He wrote, current philosophical notions characteristic of the most accepted system or manner of thought in any age and country are apt to exercise over men's minds an influence which is often in inverse ratio to the clearness with which the notions themselves are conceived and the evidence for which for the philosophical doctrines implied in their acceptance is examined and estimated. That is to say, people are most attracted to systems that have the least evidence and which are the most incomprehensible. Sidgwick also subjected evolutionary ethics to a careful analysis and explained why it wasn't valid. Most of the supporters of evolutionary ethics constructed their arguments along the following line. There are variations, but they basically follow uh, the, these two arguments. A survey of human society revealed a common set of moral principles. So you shouldn't murder. You find this all over the world. And that they, these principles grow out of the revolu evolutionary history of humans and are therefore natural. Natural in the sense that either these principles provide an evolutionary advantage and therefore persisted, or secondly, two, that these pr principles have led and are leading to a future state of optimal well-being for humans. So this is leading to a better society. Sidgwick argued that the basic methods used in these justifications were not valid. Describing how people act tells us merely about customs and is, and is no value to ethics. Describing behavior that has lasted because of evolutionary reasons and are therefore natural is a confused view because any impulse, desire, tendency that has lasted is natural. People can be naturally aggressive, naturally selfish, etc. How do we choose what we take as significantly natural, that is to say good, without some prior justified criterion? That is, what grounds do we have for selecting certain behavior and saying it's good as opposed to bad? What about the argument used by Spencer and others that certain natural behavior will lead to some future perfect state. Again, Sidgwick states that just saying that certain behavior will bring about some future state has no force unless we have justification for saying that future state is good. 
which none of the evolutionary ethicists could do. At best, they could make a plausible scenario as to how certain moral codes originated, or could argue that following them, some future social conditions could result. But why the moral code was a preferred one, or why the future state was one worth striving towards, remained elusive. That is to say, what grounds do we have in believing what we all agree is wrong really is wrong? How do we argue with a pedophile or a homicidal maniac that his behavior is really wrong, not that we just don't like it? Philosophers, although very concerned about establishing a foundation for ethics, have continued to dismiss any new efforts to resurrect versions of evolutionary ethics. Attempts were made early, early in, the, in the 20th century and again around the middle of the century, but to little effect. It has reemerged in the past couple decades again, however, due to the synthesis of animal behavior and evolution, or what's pop popularly called sociobiology. E.O. Wilson's classic text of 1975, by that name, is a brilliant discussion that pulls together research from the modern theory of evolution, population biology, and the study of animal behavior. The central thesis of the book is that behavior is adaptive and can be understood best from an evolutionary perspective. Not just animal behavior, but according to Wilson and a number of writers inspired by him, human behavior, human values, and ethics. Wilson wrote in the final chapter of sociobiology, scientists and humanists should consider together the possibility that the time has come for ethics to be removed temporarily from the hands of philosophers and biologicized. So what does this mean? Or what could it mean? In a constructively Darwinian sense, Wilson, Franz Duval, and others believe that the study of animal behavior can reveal the origins of human morality. They see morality as part of our instinctive mental makeup, which has an adaptive function. Wilson calls attention to the work on genetic explanations of altruistic behavior in animals, which, which claims that such actions, far from lowering fitness, actually increases copies of the animal's genes in the next generation. Duvall believes that the empathy that we seem to observe in primates is a significant precursor of morality in human society. That is, human morality grows out of primate sociability. So far, so good. These are empirical claims, and further research may strengthen or weaken the arguments. It's the further claim that biology can serve as a guide to ethics that they want to pursue, because that's the one that relates to our topic. Wilson has been adamant that, quoting him again, ethical philosophy must not be left in the hands of the merely wise. Only hard-won empirical knowledge of our biological nature will allow us to make optimum choices among the competing criteria of progress. This will, will give us the, the insight as to what really is uh, good, what's really bad. He tells us, quoting him again, the principal task of human biology is to identify and to measure the constraints that influence the decisions of ethical philosophers and everyone else, and to infer their significance through neurophysiological and phylogenetic reconstructions of the mind. In the process, it will fashion a biology of ethics, which will make possible the selection of a more deeply understood and enduring code of moral values." Unquote. Biology, then, can serve as a guide to the moral dilemmas that confront modern society. E.O. Wilson elaborated on this in his Pulitzer Prize-winning book on human nature. His starting point <clears throat> is his concern that modern society has lost its cultural and spiritual bearings. Where are we to look for guidance in a post-ideological society? The truths that energized earlier generations have faded like mirages, according to Wilson. Instead, he seeks guidance from our ever-expanding knowledge in neuroscience, evolutionary biology, and biochemistry. Some of the problems that have bedeviled humans have deep biological roots, and it is only now that we're catching a glimpse of them. Pathways laid down in the history of our species continue to prompt our actions, and Wilson argues that we have to dissect them and decide which ones to follow and which to control. 
In other words, we need a new morality, one informed by the latest biological science. At this point, of course, one has to ask, what are the criteria that we should use um, with our newfound knowledge? Here's where Wilson's book makes its most interesting, if most speculative, claims. As a starting point to any discussion of morality, Wilson tells us we must recognize our mammalian and primate ancestry and the importance of genetic fitness. It is with an eye towards our biological legacy that we can rethink what a natural and meaningful ethics might be. In the concluding chapter of his book on human nature, a chapter entitled Hope, he sketches a new approach to ethics based on his knowledge of evolution. What are the guiding principles and virtues of this new ethics? First and most basic is the survival of the gene pool. Not only survival, but second, preservation of the entire pool with all of its diversity. Unlike the naive eugenicists of the early part of the 20th century, Wilson argues for preserving all of the gene pool in order to maintain its maximum diversity. This move recalls Dobzhansky's somewhat controversial stress on the importance of a species maintaining as much of its diversity as possible as a storage bank for potentially useful variation. Even many deleterious variations, Dobzhansky believed, were adaptive in their heterozygous form. Wilson values maintaining diversity because individuals of exceptional ability are the result of rare combinations. And therefore, we need to maintain an enormous and diverse gene pool to allow those unusual combinations to occur. And then third, we need the protection of universal human rights. This, or human, this Wilson argues, follows from our mammalian origins. For mammals seek individual reproductive success, and social, apologies, social policies should promote it. This is, of course, quite a stretch. For one could protect, indeed encourage, individual reproductive success without full implementation of human rights. Free love camps for teenagers would be direct and effective policies, but, un but one unlikely to become government programs in the next few years. Next to these cardinal points are a set of secondary values, virtues, if you like. That is to say, that is to say they don't follow directly from a calculus of genetic fitness, but rather a part of a cascade of decisions, as Wilson calls them, that have historically served as the enabling mechanisms for survival and reproductive success. That's a quotation. Just to list them. Exploration, success in battle, success in sport, altruistic acts, ethnic and national pride, family ties, and biophilic pleasure. What are we to make of this list, aside from intuiting that its creator lives in a liberal enclave in the northeastern part of the United States? <laughs> I teach a course each year at Oregon State on the history of the theory of evolution. In it, I sometimes, I, not sometimes, in it I discuss some of the social and cultural dimensions of the theory. And when I discuss the modern synthesis, the modern theory, I describe Wilson's evolutionary ethics as an attempt to provide a truly Darwinian interpretation, unlike the more Lamarckian theories of the 19th and early 20th centuries. I also have a throwaway line that if one summer I had some time, I'd undertake a project to demonstrate that one could substitute an antithetical set of values for Wilson's that would be consistent with the theory of evolution thereby showing how underdetermined Wilson's position is. That's to say, one can derive almost everything. Therefore, evolution doesn't imply anything when it comes to ethics. So let me use this lecture as an opportunity to sketch this, that position. That's to say, let me present a jaundiced view of, oops, of, uh, oh my, I must have left that a slide. Um, Yeah, I did. of um, Wilson's ethics. Such an evolutionary ethics might look like this. I'll start with this central criterion, survival of the human gene pool. Why accept that? Of what cosmic importance is the survival of the human gene pool? 
taking the long view, a dispassionate, molluscan eye might note, might note that humans seem to be causing an alteration of the environment that is resulting in the loss of habitat and responsible for the extinction of species at a rate, some say 30,000 a year, which many scientists believe is as great or greater than the five main extinction events found in the fossil record. So we're creating something as bad as all the, the, the worst um, extinction uh, episodes. Are we the greatest threat to the biosphere today? Would the destruction of the human gene pool be a better thing than its survival? If each species were given a vote, I suspect that the verdict would be that from a biological, general evolutionary point of view, the destruction of the human gene pool would be a positive event. Although Wilson might object that the survival of the human gene pool is best for humans, we could remind him that he has written passionately about the need to preserve biodiversity from destruction by Homo sapiens. Next, let us consider Wilson's principle of uh, universal human rights. This has been a powerful myth of the 20th century, but historians realize that in its name, enormous repression has been committed. When I was working in Paris on the history of 18th century life sciences, I ran across some letterhead stationery from the early days of the Republic during the French Revolution that captures this well. This, this is what's written across the top there. Um, liberté, égalité, fraternité, ou la mort. So liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. The motto was also painted on the facades of houses in Paris and other cities for several years. As the terror in France graphically demonstrated, universal human rights always excluded some. Women didn't get rights from the French Revolution. And political rights without economic ones are meaningless, as Marx pointed out long ago. But those are historical qualifications, not biological arguments. And Wilson could dismiss them as imperfections of history and the lack of clarity uh, that science can overcome. But does biology insist on rights? There are no rights in the living world. Mammals may strive for individual reproductive success, but we, do we want to mimic the white tooth shrews that are notorious poly, polygonous and polyandrous, that is to say, males as females, males as well as females, mate with everything in sight. Their behavior provides unusually high levels of genetic diversity in their populations, but I don't think they provide a healthy model for humans to follow. What about some of the secondary values, the virtues, as we might call them? Let me go through a couple. I'm not going to go through all of them, just, just a few to give you a, a sense of how one might do this. One of Wilson's positive secondary values is exploration. The opposite of that would be remaining stationary. Why explore unless a need arise, arises? Biologically, species have evolved to, ad to adapt to specific environments. In some cases, exploration can extend the range or open up new ones. But more often than not, complex ecosystems will not give an opening to a foreign invader. Expending energy on exploration might be less efficient than exploiting the environment in ever more efficient ways. On a human scale, one can understand a dense population seeking additional resources. But why posit exploration as a value? Cultures have not universally embraced it. The Ming Dynasty, um, pictured here, between 1405 and 1433 sent seven enormous expeditions to explore vast portions of the globe. Pro-expansionist factions of the court, led by the eunuch factions, met strong resistance in the traditional Confucian factions, and the voyages ended. The Chinese, in fact, decided exploration was too costly, and in 1525 destroyed all of its ocean-going ships. One can perhaps exploit or explore for plunder, which is lucrative, as the Vikings did. But is this a positive value that we want to encourage? There's a lively debate going on in the United States about the current space pro program. During the Cold War, there were alleged military and strategic goals at stake in the space race. But it's not clear that there are any now, nor is the commercial value of space taken very seriously. And certainly some people can make money. But the issue is, can the total cost of the space uh, research be recouped? 
While we might find a lot of interesting information on Mars about the origin and history of our solar system, given the enormous social issues the US faces, and given the ever-increasing budget deficits that threaten to destroy whatever safety net the US has, does expending millions of dollars in space travel constitute a good choice? One might argue that much change has resulted from past exploration. However, the amount of good it has produced is difficult to assess. And as we know, some people benefit more than others. European expansion into the Americas helped create the modern industrial world, but it destroyed most of the indigenous American population and brought about a devastating exchange of diseases and pests on both sides of the Atlantic. Winning in sports is another natural Wilson virtue, and one can contrast it with cooperative play. This is a topic that academics can spend a lot of time discussing. Let me just mention that the quest for winning in US college football and basketball has led to a scandalous escalation in college sports budgets, which in the majority of schools, in spite of all the hype to the contrary, draws resources away from the academic side of the institution and creates a carnival atmosphere that undermines the main missions of many universities. I'm very impressed that UCSB doesn't have a football team. This is, so I take it you have a more serious campus than OSU. <clears throat> Can the violence that plagues national and international soccer have any redeeming value? Soccer hooligans have been such a problem that national teams have taken desperate measures. Greece banned all fans from road games in 2000. And in spite of all efforts, Argentina has experienced hundreds of injuries and deaths in pregame violence. Ghana had over 100 people killed at a single game in 2001, when clashes between the supporters of their two leading teams created a stampede. Perhaps this violence eliminates idiotic fans, but I doubt that this has important <laughs> biological value. Ethnic or national pride is another virtue, and it can be contrasted with humanism. Wilson wrote his book in the 70s, well before the fall of Yugoslavia and the genocides in Rwanda or Darfur, or the eruption of Sunni-Shia conflicts in Iraq. Given the events of the past decade, the term ethnic pride has taken on a much more sinister connotation than the image of annual St. Patrick Day parades in Chicago might conjure up. Ethnic pride, in the sense of ethnic cleansing, seems to undermine one of Wilson's criteria preserving the gene pool in all of its diversity. If ethnic loyalty, loyalty leads to exclusion and ethnic groups discourage exo exogamy, then human subpopulations will decrease in their genetic diversity. Similarly, nationalism of the 20th century, uh, which led uh, to two world wars, were biologically suicidal and counter to uh, preserving diversity. Finally, let me just mention one of uh, Wilson's favorite virtues, biophilic pleasure, that's to say the love of nature, which can be contrasted with indifference or hostility towards nature. Wilson has written on what he believes is an instinctive love of nature in humans. It's not clear that there's much evidence for this. With any historical knowledge, this is difficult to support. For most of European history, much of nature was frightening and hostile. It was only in the 19th century that the Alps were seen as majestic and the forest as not terrifying. Our folk stories about wolves and snakes hardly reflect biophilia. Only the middle class in modern times has the time, resources, and security to indulge its sentiment for nature. As omnivores, the living world is our dinner. Our strongest innate feelings are for others of our own species. After that, in the complex culture that we inherit, inhabit, our concern for alligators have to face off against our attraction to Gucci shoes. It's a cruel and hard world, I'm afraid. Those aren't actually Gucci shoes. I couldn't find anything on uh, Google, Google image of Gucci shoes, but you get the idea. Now, I know some of these examples are less than robust, and I suspect many of you have already thought of counterexamples. But in a way, that reinforces my point. What Wilson has done is to pick a set of values that he considers positive. They're the ones that provide a moral compass for him and the ones he finds comfortable. His book attempts to show how those values have an evolutionary basis. I frankly find the argument 
that 100 million years of evolution has been leading up to a white Protestant middle class morality. No more convincing than Ernst Haeckel uh, or Hegel's view that human history has been leading up to the 19th century German state. It would be more convincing if Wilson had derived some truly novel values, ones that directly contradict those of his colleagues and friends, such as a defense of slavery based on the lessons from ant societies. Now, that might be a reprehensible view, but at least it would suggest that he had approached the issue without a set of values already established. What I've partly shown is that using the same basic evolutionary position, humans, that, that humans are biological species and have evolved as other social animals, we can defend opposing sets of values. This demonstrates that Wilson's values don't follow from evolution. That evolution does not imply a particular set of moral principles. Rather, evolution provides an, an underdetermined ethical stance. Just as in the 19th century, social thinkers used Darwin to justify diametrically opposed policies, and social Darwinism was used to promote conservative as well as liberal positions in economics and politics. It's not, it's not difficult to see why. Human values are part of cultural systems, and cultural systems are not simply reflections of biological ones. Wilson is probably correct that our biological inheritance places limits on our behavior and may in fact be the source of various psychological tendencies. But that has to do with behavior, not our moral judgments on how we are to behave. Alfred Kinsey showed that males raised in rural settings had engaged in a surprisingly high degree of sex with animals. But that didn't convince anybody, or I shouldn't say didn't convince many people in 1948 that it was acceptable behavior. Even Wilson says we have to control and guide our behavior. Biology, however, is not going to supply the rules for that. What can we conclude from these examples? Foremost, I think, we have to realize that when it comes to values, they are read into nature rather than derived. We will not be able to find answers to our ethical questions in nature because the answers are not there. Similarly, when we go to define or characterize what's natural, we must be extremely careful. When we read the writings of historical figures like Linnaeus or Darwin, their prior commitments are pretty obvious, as are, the as are their conceptions of nature. In our own time, I think we face a problem due to the serious lack of perspective when it comes to the world of science. For much of the 20th century, science has sought to reveal nature. It didn't take the assault of postmodernism to erode the naive view of science as a mirror of nature. Intellectual historians and philosophers argued convincingly, and with rich historical examples, that philosophical assumptions were built into science, and that scientists often inserted, sometimes unconsciously, values into their picture of nature. Scientific racism is perhaps the most notorious example, a set of beliefs that rested on an, empirically, an empirical base <clears throat> that was scandalously thin. So there is a useful corrective in the intellectual history and history of science literature to the naive view that science is universal and value-free. But unfortunately, that message has tended to be drowned out in recent years by the cultural wars that pitted a renewed positivism against an almost anarchic set of theoreticians, often, although not always, with strong political agendas. What are we to make of this now? Nature and the natural are embedded in broader worldviews and need to be evaluated with an eye towards the assumptions that we have built in. Ethical questions have to be examined in the context of bodies of literature that address ethics, not animals. We know our cultures are very plastic, and what's accepted in one can be violently rejected in another. When we look to historical examples, we see that cultural values are read into nature, into the gods, into other legitimating systems. Why not just get to the issues directly? Perhaps we should return to some sort of pragmatism. That is to, that is to say, the philosophy associated with uh, Dewey, uh, John Dewey, William James, and, and Charles Pierce. Uh, the tradition that maintains a strong skepticism of absolutes, that searches for hidden assumptions and opinions, and that's willing to settle for provisional truths. Most important, it's a tradition that's deeply infused with humanism and sees philosophy as an ongoing discussion about what sort of world we want to live in, 
What sort of society do we desire? What sort of environment do we wish for the future? For those wanting fast, quick answers or rock-solid conclusions, it's not very satisfying. But for those who know of the fanaticism of the 30s and 40s, the vapid self-preoccupation of the 50s, and the more recent self-destructive decades of the 90s, it has a certain appeal. The good can be a category informed by empirical information, but defined by negotiation. It's not easy, but it can be clearer and more honest than many previous attempts. There are many avenues of dealing with ethical issues, and they have been and are being explored by a number of philosophers. My point, then, is that I think it's time for ethics to be de-biologicized and return to the merely wise if we want to make progress in addressing the complex dilemmas that we face in biomedical research as well as in everyday life. I'm going to let Professor Farber field his own questions, but uh, Aaron and Nareg have microphones. So if you would like to address a question to Professor Farber, please raise your hand. Yeah. Do I need a microphone? Yes. So you started to address this in the end, and I'm hoping you can maybe expound on this a little more. But uh, why? Why do you believe that traditional approaches to ethics and morality are necessarily better then? I mean, I, I sort of take your point very well that there's some problems with the biology-centered point of view or whatever you want to call it, but um, I still need to be convinced maybe that, that other approaches are actually the right or the better way. Yeah, are there um, absolute reasons? Are there pragmatic reasons? No, I just think it's, it's the appropriate forum. That is, um, I don't think biology... I think biology gives us the illusion of having values because we've read our values into nature. So what we do is we read our values in and we discover them. Um, so I think what, what we need to do is talk about the values themselves. And I think that's what philosophers do. Um, Isn't there some illusion the, there as well? Well, um, I would argue they have not been enormously successful but it still seems to me the only forum. I mean, where else, what other, what other valid uh, I mean, there, there forum would there be? There are in either case, right? Uh, things that you bring to the table right. that, that aren't proven. Yeah, you right, right, right. And, and you know, I wonder if, if, if yeah. it would no, be no, a profitable it's... exercise to try to compare them in some, in some sense. I, I think that good philosophers are aware of their assumptions and discuss them. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, I think, and one of the reasons I'm fond of the pragmatists, which is the only American school of philosophy, is that they're very aware of their assumptions, want to get them out on the table, and basically say, okay, um, we're never going to agree on any absolute set. Let's try to figure out which ones might take us to the kind of world we want to have. And let's talk about that. What kind of world do we want to live in? And what sort of society should we construct to get to that kind of world? So everyone then can you know, have their say and it has to be negotiated. And that, that's what's attractive about pragmatism. Has it been successful? No. Uh, but, yeah, Larry. You've done a lovely job of showing how people cherry pick uh, their examples to prove their points mm -hmm. and uh, thoroughly convincing. Uh, so uh, ethics don't come from heredity. Personally, I don't think they come from religion. Uh, do they come from rational thought? And have people been all that rational all the time? Um, well, ethics is a rational discussion of the good and the bad. So, you know, so by definition, it's a rational conversation. Um, it's certainly the case that one can well imagine a society without philosophers or people who talk about ethics, who could you know, have um, values that inform their actions. The value of ethics is when you have conflict. Um, it allows you then to, to sort of step back and just sort of, instead of slugging it out, to be able to say, okay, let's talk about this. Um, 
why would one, what are the consequences of one action versus another action? Uh, can we can see in some sense some action might be preferable? So I think it has a value. Um, but yeah, human history is, is not too um, encouraging about how well we've been able to do this as a species. <laughs> and turning on the television every day, in fact, reinforces the very negative view. Yeah. Um, if you take the uh, pragmatic position and it's more relativistic, doesn't that somewhat undergird the very, or not undergird, but um, okay. dismantle the very notion of ethics as a universal ought that, that everyone is obliged to do or, or to, to fall under? And how would you achieve that some sort of universal nature of it if people disagree? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. Um, I think the American pragmatists sort of gave up on universal uh, truths. Um, and basically want to say, okay, let's as a society have a conversation and see if we can come to some consensus. And a consensus, uh, if we can come to a consensus and if following those rules um, turn out to lead to um, a stable society or a society that we find uh, acceptable, um, that's good enough. So it's utilitarian. Yeah, it's utilitarian ultimately in, in some fashion. Yeah. Well, there, yeah. Should okay. everyone then feel compelled to follow follow the plan? <laughs> As you brought up earlier, how do you talk to a pedophile? Not? Yeah. If no, it's for. Doesn't yeah. Doesn't agree with that vision. Yeah. Philosophically, how do you yeah. you know include them in? <laughs> um, not easily. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, that's right. I mean, it's, it's by force. Is that the only? Is that the bottom line? Well, I, uh, I mean, if you, ask the, if you ask William James, he would probably, he'd probably say that, sure, that we, in fact, um, law is the extension of ethics and that um, we have to have an ongoing conversation as a society and continually revise our laws in, in, in light of, of experience. Uh, but yeah, th th at some point, um, there has to be a, a, a consensus or at least a majority that, that come to certain views. But yeah, it's, it's highly problematic. I don't want to um, pretend otherwise. Um, mostly I want to, I think it's careful, it's important, however, to keep in mind that certain solutions are not going to work. And that, that's, that's the message of my talk. It's I think on that note, we'll uh, thank Professor Farber one last time.